Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, my good friend, world traveler, and best-selling author of The Catch Me If You Can, Jessica Nabongo, talks to me about making bold choices to curate a life you love. When I was growing up, my parents gave me the freedom to try many different things, like singing, dancing, and acting. They encouraged me to ignite my curiosity and dream big. Today, I'm so grateful to them because their trust in me empowered my choices. This trust my parents built in me at a young age later helped me pursue acting without fear. I know mine is not everyone's story, but my conversation with Jessica reminded me that despite our circumstances, we all have the power to make bold choices to have the lives we imagine. For me, it's about intentional living. You can live life or you can let life happen to you. Life is not happening to me. I am curating my life. And once I really decided that, I felt more empowered. Jessica's life hasn't always been easy, but every risk has been worth it. Dear listener, everything you need to pursue the life of your dreams is already inside of you. So choose today to be fearless and get out of your own way. We only get one life, so let's make it beautiful and let's live it with intention. And in our Sankofa moment, Jessica tells us where she's taking a famous globe trotter and why. Oh, that was a pet place that was really special to him. There's just images of him there that I think about a lot. Jessica, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so Hi, excited about this. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. We've been talking about this and I'm so happy you're here for a myriad of, of reasons. Many, many, many reasons. Um, you are, it's funny. Well, actually you tell me first, how did we meet? You know what's so crazy? So we have a <laughs> bunch of mutual friends and I think we've been following each other and, you know, we DM here and there. And then the first time we met in person was at Macro's pre-Oscar party. And the crazy thing is, it was like, friend! <laughs> it is like, I actually, this is the first time I'm meeting you. But it felt like we were so connected already. So it was it was amazing to finally get to meet in person. Yes, you, it, I, I love experiences like the one we shared because... You know, social media can be a really wild, crazy, and wacky place, but it can also be a place where you can genuinely connect with people that are on different parts of the world, um, yeah. but that you just know is a kindred spirit for you. And that's who you were for, for me, sure. who you are for me. What I love about you is that before, you know, we became friends, you were an inspiration to me. And I think that that is such a beautiful nucleus for our relationship. And you are someone who not only inspires me, but you inspire the world, Jessica. You are a walking, talking, living, breathing inspiration, a God-given gift. And I am so excited to get to know you better and to be, as I'm sure we all will be, even more inspired. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. I'm gonna. I'm like, I don't know how many minutes into this I'm gonna begin crying, but I'm excited to explore that. <laughs> Girl, listen, we shed some tears over here, okay? Um, so before we like jump, jump, jump into it, I want to start with an icebreaker question. Are you down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm down? Okay. So Jessica, of all the countries that you've traveled to, which place has made you feel the most at home, and why? You know, it's really interesting that this question um, is so interesting because for me, it's not a place. So for me, home really is in people. And when I think about that, I'm like, I have homes in Amman, Jordan. I have homes in Nairobi, Kenya. I have homes in Dakar, Senegal, uh, in London, in Detroit, in LA, because for me, it's the people. So even like I traveled to 89 countries solo and I have all these little homes. Like now when I go back to so many of these countries, I'm going to visit people that feel like family. So for me, it's, it's not a single place because home for me is in the people. 
Jessica, of course home for you is in the people. Of course it is. Because that's who you are. <laughs> I love you so much. Yes, that's so beautiful. That and that and honestly, that's how it should be, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's only in people truly that you can find love and and mm-hmm. energy that can transcend anything. So, you yeah. know, um, the landscape or the country is really an added bonus and we get to see sure. what God created, but it's mm-hmm. the people who make it home. I, I truly agree. So Jessica, we have to go back to the beginning. What has Detroit given you? Oh, what has Detroit given me? We know what Detroit gave you. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Detroit gave me a D-boy from the east side. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Um, I think Detroit gave me my grit. You know, there's a a grit and a resilience um, and a sort of like you can't F with me kind of energy mm. that I think Detroit gave me for sure. And, and, and I carry that with me in business <laughs> and in life. So it's really that, that great. And you can't F with me. Energy definitely came from Detroit. You know what? Here's the thing. I know I have a lot of friends, family, obviously from Detroit. Um, and honestly, I would say that is to be true about everybody I know from Detroit. Mm-hmm. Everyone is un f I do think that that, it's an armor. It's an armor that mm-hmm. can come off, right? But mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. you all somehow know when to have the armor off and when to take it off a little bit more than maybe everyone else in the other cities in the, in the world. So <laughs> I can definitely attest to that. Jessica, I want to know, how has what you've received from home, from your parents, from your upbringing, served you in all the places that you travel? You know, I think the biggest thing for me is that my parents never put boundaries on us. You know, some people say they gave you a lot of rope to hang yourself with. Um, And that made me realize and believe and internalize that anything was possible. And my parents are, well, my father passed, my mom's still alive, very generous people. Right. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you're their children, but some parents aren't generous. But I think about all of the things I wanted to do. I started playing the piano at the age of three and doing ballet and tap and percussion and basketball and softball and tennis and all these different things. And when I wanted to quit, they let me quit. It wasn't like we paid our money. You have to finish. Da, 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 da. So to that end, they really sort of um, helped to stoke my curiosity because I would try any and everything. I'd be like, come home. Okay, I want to I want to do this. I want to go to this like pre-engineering class. I want to go, you know, I want to play the clarinet. And they were always there to like let me do those things and when I didn't want to do it anymore, it was like, okay, whatever. And I think because of that, I've quit a lot of my jobs. <laughs> but <Ditto. laughs> right? But it also it helped me to create a life in which when I don't like doing something, I quit. Mm. And it's okay because I'm like, mm. I don't like doing that. I don't need to commit to it. I don't need to suffer through it. I don't like this. So I'm going to do something else. And I really think that's because of the openness with which my parents raised me. And beyond that, I grew up in a home full of books and a globe and encyclopedias. So I was an avid reader. My first degree is in English literature. So, and I think once you read and you grow up with books, the world becomes your oyster, right? Because you're you, and not only that, you understand people because the characters you're reading about in different settings, and and so all of that really shaped my life. Like, and then growing up in a Ugandan home, growing up African in America, uh, was also a very unique and interesting experience, which I think has completely shaped who I am today. As you were talking about growing up in a house full of books and reading from a young age, you know. The beautiful thing about reading is that it takes you somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's making me realize that that's really when you first started to travel was in all mm-hmm. of these books. And, and I mm-hmm. don't think that people sometimes look at books in that way. Books sometimes mm-hmm. can take people out of situations that they can't physically ever get out of, but mm-hmm. their books can take them there. Their minds can take them there. 
Yeah. And it's interesting, like doing a book with National Geographic is obviously like a huge honor and privilege. I've gotten so many emails and DMs about the book and how much people are loving it. A woman who has MS sent me a DM and she said, I can't travel. Thank you for this book because it's allowing me to see the world. Mm, when I wow. Can. You know, and so books were so important and they transported me. And now to have a book, which was the number one best selling travel book in the US. Oh, um, no, no, no. Don't say it like that. Say it again. <laughs> say it again. Say it the again. number one best selling travel book in the US. In the book, I talk, I give 100 stories from 100 of the 195 countries that I visited. And with over 300 images, it really does transport people. And on the audio book, I speak in 80 different languages. And it's just really been a beautiful experience to see other people experiencing the book and really feel like my singular book is transporting people to 100 different countries around the world. Mm. Yeah, books are everything. Books are everything. They really are. The thing about books is that books are forever. Forever. They're forever. They're forever. And so I'm so grateful that you've given us something that is forever. Okay, Jessica, so I want to go back to, you talked about how like growing up, um, you know, your parents didn't, they let you live, basically. You know, mm-hmm. they encourage you to live the life that you wanted to live from a very young age, which I think is very edifying for a child. I had a similar experience. I remember my parents being far more trusting of me than my other friends, right? Like, I didn't have the same rules. And by my parents doing that with me, what it taught me is that by them trusting me, I then could trust myself. I can fail. I can make, you know, odd choices, but I'm still here. I still am okay. Mm -hmm. I can choose to not make the same choice over and over and over again. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I just love that we both had that because I think it allows you to be a dreamer, right? When you get older. (laughs) And that's the point, right? A lot of people, their parents beat the dreams out of them for such an early age. We've lost so many creatives, right? not through physical death, but they're doing other things that maybe their parents wanted them to do or a parent said to them, painting is a hobby or what I I will say, my mother did tell me I wanted to go to FIT when I graduated from high school. And my mother was like, fashion is a hobby. I, and you know, I don't know where my life would have went if I became a designer at 18, but (laughs) she was not feeling that. That was the one thing. And I'll never forget that. She said that I'll never let her forget that she said that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, think about all of the dreams that have actually been crushed by people's parents. And so, you know, should I ever have children, I'm going to give them the same leeway that my parents gave me. Because, again, it's about trusting that you have raised good children, mm-hmm. right? And trusting that you've instilled principles into them that they will carry forward to make the decisions that they need to make on their own. Yeah, So, Jessica, you also really, in a lot of ways, had autonomy over your life and what you wanted to do and who you wanted to be and what made you happy. Then you never hesitated to quit something or leave something or someone, I would assume as well, that wasn't for you. And so I think there's a lot of people who want to do that, right? I would say probably 85% of the world of the people in the world want to just do what you and I have the shared experience of doing, which is being like, "Uh, this don't work for me, I'm leaving. But how do you explain to someone how to actually make that a reality? So when I turned 30, I did this blog post and it was called 10 Lessons from a 30-Year-Old Nomad. Mm. And part of that was around helping people do that. And I think the thing is, I always remind people, everything in life is a choice. Every single thing. Every single thing. And people be like, well, I didn't have a choice. Every single thing is a choice. Now, there's other factors that go into how you make a decision. But everything you do is a choice. And for me, it's about intentional living. Right? So you can live life or you can let life happen to you. I, you know, I dealt with a lot of mental health issues, struggles, like 
really, really, really bad deep depression from like my teenage years until probably about maybe my late twenties. I climbed out. Uh, like around twenty nine, I managed to like get up that ladder and see the light. And so going through that, and what made the shift in my life was realizing I am in control of my life. I can make decisions to make my life be different. Life is not happening to me. I am curating my life. Mm. And once I really decided that, I felt more empowered. So people will say, well, I can't quit this job because I need to pay my bills. No, you're choosing to be in a job that you hate because you need, you know, whatever those bills are. Are they necessary? Can you reduce the number of bills you have? In reducing the number of bills you have, can you get another job that maybe pays less but still covers your bills? And it's about thinking about every little bit of it. So for me, for a while, every day I woke up, I tried to be intentional and really think about every single thing that I do. I just deleted Instagram. Again, I think we all go through this because I'm like, I'm spending two to three hours a day on there what am I even doing? And so I don't know what I'm going to do with this newfound two to three hours a day, but I just know I want to be way more intentional with my time. So that's just a little example. But for me, the biggest thing is realizing that you are the only, you are the sole architect of your life. There is nothing else that designs your life and no one else that designs your life except for you. And once you accept that, And in that acceptance, no, you have every single thing inside of you to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It already exists in you. It's not that Elon Musk has something else. Now, okay, we can get into arguments around capital, right? Like capital Mm -hmm. can separate Mm -hmm. some opportunities. But outside of that, it's like he came up with an idea, Bill Gates came up with an idea. Steve Jobs came up with an idea. All of these people, Beyonce, okay, she has talent, but it's all of these things are just ideas. She didn't, Beyonce didn't go and buy talent. It was inside of her and she cultivated it. Mm -hmm. So we look at people and we idolize all of these people as if they're not human. These people are not superheroes. They're not magical unicorns. They're the same as you and me. But they realize their power, whether their power is in their talent, whether it's their brain and it's their ability to create products, you know, and ideas, it's inside of them. And so it's inside of all of us. And I think once you accept that, like that you're in control and you have everything inside of you, that's how you change your life. Mm. Jessica, that's so good. I mean, I always say leaps of faith are always rewarded. It's just Mm -hmm. how Mm -hmm. God works. It's always rewarded. You're never going to take a leap of faith and nothing. Now, the caveat is it might not be instantaneous and it most definitely will not be on your timeline, but it will be rewarded. So if you are at a job, in a relationship, in a friendship that does not serve you, does not bring you joy, as you said, Jessica, it is your life. Make a different choice. Pivot. So I just mm-hmm. really want to encourage you all, just literally, like mm-hmm. Nike said, just do it. Because just the thing it. is, people say, like, what's there to lose? Everything. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's everything to lose. There's but how much are you your losing life. already? The thing is, how much are you losing already? And people don't consider that. Mm. What have you given up to stay in that job that you hate? What have you given up to stay with that partner that you don't like or, you know, you're not completely satisfied? What are you giving up? You're already losing. If you're dissatisfied with your life, you're already losing. So wouldn't you just want to try something different and just see what's on the other side? I think that's like a sign to, you know, let's get on the good foot. Um, Mm -hmm. So, Jessica, you actually, you broke up with the corporate ideal of success, which is, I think, what we're talking about. Mm. How did you do that? Was it in a similar vein of kind of what we're just talking about? Were you scared? What did you do? So I was working for um, Pfizer. I was doing pharmaceutical sales. I was in Detroit. I was making great money. I was 21. I bought myself a two-bedroom, two-bath condo on the waterfront. Mm. I looked at Canada every morning out of my window 
living the good life. I had a lot of disposable income, company car, was like partying in Miami and New York with my friends like every other weekend, living the good life. Had a ton of clothes, had a custom closet with all this stuff, going shopping every week. I felt so empty. And I've always had a commitment to excellence and and academics and work and extracurricular activities, everything. And I think, and also growing up in a home with like, my mom was a registered nurse, my dad was a chemist. I've always had this idea of a meritocracy and I was working super hard. And on bonus day, I got my three digit bonus and I was like, this is some BS. And I was like, I've been working so hard and this is my reward. Like, this is not fair. It's not fair. Mm. And it broke something in me. And I was like, I'm not working this hard. And then I started evaluating everything. Why do I have all these pants? Why do I have all these shoes? Why do I care about any of this stuff? And so I decided I was going to move to Japan and teach English. You know, the world, the the world, the economy went into, um, what was that? That was like 2008. So the economy was basically crashing. The company had laid off 20,000 people. I did not get laid off. And I was so annoyed because I wanted that severance package <laughs> because I knew I was going to leave. And um, and I left and I moved to Japan. I shaved my head. My family thought I was crazy. I put all my stuff in storage. I sold a bunch of stuff. And I just went to Japan. And I didn't know what I was doing, why I was doing it. But I was like, you know, if this doesn't work out, I always worked really hard. And, you know, for me, I'm like, I build in safety nets. So I can always go back to a job that I've quit because I did well. I didn't have a fear of the unknown. I didn't know what Japan was going to be like. I had never been to Asia. I'd been to like nine other countries, but I'd never been to Asia. I got on that plane. I was the only black person in a sea of Asians. I was like, wow, this is about to be crazy. And it stretched me in ways that I could have never imagined. We have to let go of the fear of the unknown because so much of our fear of the unknown is like around negative thinking. Because we think it's going to be bad. Because if you have a fear of the unknown and you're thinking it's good, then you can still move forward. But that fear comes from a a place of negativity and a feeling that whatever is on the other side, the unknown is going to be bad. I never had that fear because I'm always like, I think this could be good. And if it's not good, I'll go back home. And so I think for me, that's how I was able to do it. And the thing is, it was tough for me to figure out what I wanted to do. But when I didn't like something, I always knew I had to quit. I never stayed at a job where I was like miserable. I never did that. Mm -hmm. I would always be like, I'm out. I don't need this. (laughs) Bye, y'all. You know, and I think, again, it's about creating safety nets. So my safety nets were excellent in my job, whether I liked it or not, being excellent is a safety net. I quit my job at the UN several times and they always took me back because I would I would go work, save money, quit the job, travel, run out of money, go back, <laughs> work again, <laughs> save money, and rinse and repeat. So my safety nets were excellent, financial safety net. You know, I was always conscious about how I dealt with my money and making sure I had some money in saving. And beyond that, I would say, my family and my network, right? No matter what happens to me, I can always go back to my mom. Even if like, I don't have a mom, I got my sisters. Even if I don't have my family, I've cultivated and created deep friendships where like, if I lost everything today, people will be clamoring to give me their guest bedrooms or their couches or their floors. You know what I mean? I've cultivated relationships professionally and personally where I know if the bottom falls out of everything, I got a bunch of places that when you talk about home, I got a bunch of places that I can go and call home, whether domestically or internationally, because those relationships are safety nets as well. Mm. That's beautiful, Jessica. I mean, because it's all about, I, I think what's beautiful about you is that you take who you are into every space you enter. So that's why you can go to so many places and be welcomed as if it's home. That's why is because you don't go anywhere and shrink yourself. And I think that that is so important. And it's what I always try to continue to tell myself is don't ever shrink. You know, the most powerful thing we all possess is our individuality. Mm -hmm. Nobody can take it away. Nobody can challenge it. Nobody Mm -hmm. can dispute it. Nobody can say anything about it because it's ours. 
Mm-hmm. So who are we to dim that when it's mm-hmm. really all we've got? And mm-hmm. I think that that 100%. is truly, right? Mm-hmm. That's truly how you are where you are today. Why I am where I am today. It's because we're walking in the fullness of who we are each and every day, whether people get it mm-hmm. or like it. Mm-hmm. Jessica, you've said, my journey was made beautiful by the kindness of strangers. You shared a story with us on your book tour in Los Angeles, I think about an experience in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. In Lagos. And I would love for you to share that with us, please. Yeah, it was, I was in Lagos and... I lost my phone. You know, that that pain, that anxiety, like, ah, where's my phone? And I thought somebody stole it. And we put on find my iPhone and somebody answers and they're not saying anything. We're like yelling on the phone like, ah, we're chasing the phone. We we think we're chasing the the thief. And then the phone turns off and we're like, oh. And my Nigerian friends are like, girl, that phone is gone. And I'm like, no, it can't be gone. Like, I just, I think I've been in Lagos like two days. I'm like, there's no way. So like two hours later, I'm like, can you try Find My again? And they try it and the phone is back on and it has like 10%. So we call again and finally the guy answers. And if you know Nigeria, most people speak English. This guy didn't even speak English. So this is the type of person we're talking about, right? Whatever, we organize, we, we go and we meet him. So when we get there, he's talking to my friend and he says, I'm not a thief. I saw the phone in the parking lot on the floor while I was walking to church and I picked it up. The first time when we called, he didn't say anything because he didn't know how to use the phone because he doesn't have one. Mm. And so, you know, and when I saw him, it was clear he had not showered in days. He hadn't eaten in days. So where we were, I went and I bought him some food. He devoured it. So I bought him another meal for him to take it with him. And I gave him all of the extra Naira that I had with me. And um, and a, my friend, my Nigerian friend that I was with, gave him his phone number to say, call me, I'm going to find you a job. And all of that to say, you know, it was stressful. It's stressful to lose a phone. But that man had nothing. The street value of an iPhone, like 500, even if it was just 500 US, that's crazy money in Nigerian um, Naira. And this man who had nothing gave me my phone back. And even though it caused me a lot of stress, it was an opportunity for me to give something to him. If I had not met him, he might have gone another day without food. Mm-hmm. So that anxiety that I went with, that I dealt with for not having my phone, that led to me being able to feed him, not only in that moment, but also later. And then if I didn't meet him, he wouldn't have gotten that money from me. Whatever he went and did with that money may helped him to see another few days, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's like, there's all these opportunities and we, we get frustrated and we get annoyed, but it can be an opportunity for you to bless someone. And I think more than anything, it is about the kindness of strangers. But overall, it's about being a good neighbor. I believe mm. the world is our neighborhood. So why not live life being a good neighbor to everyone? Most people are good. Mm. And that's what I hope people get from my journey, Ooh. from you know these interviews, from the book. Most people are good. Just think about every single interaction you have in a single day. How many bad ones are there? Mm. You don't have a bad interaction with a human every day. You just don't. You don't. Not it's every true. single day you don't. It's true. Most people are good. Ew, gosh, Jessica, I wanted you to share that story because I've always considered myself to be a very kind, empathetic woman. But hearing your stories, it reminds me that I can go even further. I can be a greater neighbor. I can contribute my goodness even more to the world. And ultimately, right, that makes the world a better place. Jessica, you are, and what I would say, a thrilling season of your life. So much goodness, so much abundance. 
Um, and, and, you know, w- one of the reasons I wanted to create this podcast is because we focus a lot on the highlights of someone's life, mm-hmm. right? We focus a lot on like all the good things that are happening, especially when they're in the midst of a big win. But we don't talk about the things that don't feel so great in the midst of something mm. really beautiful. So if you could, I would love for you to share with me something you've experienced while in this triumphant season of your life that made you want to doubt humanity, but you chose not to. And you remembered this is one person. This is one experience. So I want you to share that with me while also telling us how you keep experiencing joy in the midst of sometimes confusion or sadness. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Ashley, oh my God. (laughs) It's a safe space, sis. Okay. I'm like, you know, life is always in ebbs and flows. And with the good, there'll always be a little not so good, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you always want to be grateful and people act like you can't complain because then there's a lack of gratitude. It's like, no, I can be grateful, but also there are some things that don't feel great. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm a very confident person. When people meet me, they're like, oh my God, you're so confident. And there's been a couple experiences where people have tried to make me feel like I'm not worthy. Mm. And I Mm. allowed them to. I allowed people to gaslight me and to make me forget who I was. And in the midst of one of the most amazing times of my life, I let them steal my joy. Mm. And, you know, these are people who on the one hand are like, you're amazing. We want to do this and this and this. And then on the other hand, they're like, you're nothing. Mm. And let me remind you why you're nothing. And, you know, no matter how confident you are, there will be people who make you question because you're like, okay, well, they're they're the expert. (sighs) Maybe I'm Mm. not. Jessica, you're about to take me out. Mm. And Mm. I remember, you know, I had this call with someone from the network and... This person had me thinking, am I even who I say I am? Mm. Maybe my point of view isn't important. Maybe everything that I've accomplished isn't noteworthy. Maybe I am smaller. Has my ego got the best of me? Has my ego blinded me? Maybe I don't deserve this. Maybe that's why I didn't get that. Mm. And I really was down. Yeah. Down. I didn't recognize myself. Mm. And I let these people take my joy. And now I'm coming out of it. And now other things have come through. Mm. And I think, you know, some of these things, I believe it's the universe reminding me you made the right decision. I'm going to give you this clear, bright, painful reminder. To affirm that you made the right decision. Because then what came on the back end and what's coming Mm. in now Mm. is way better than anything they could have ever offered me. Way better. It's like the end of last week to this week in seven days, Mm. the number of things that have come into my inbox for the universe to say, Jessica, don't ever forget who you are. Don't ever let anybody make you forget who you are. This is what you're worth. Mm. This is what you're worth. You are who you said you are. Yeah. Your voice is important. What you've done is noteworthy. You are valuable. You are needed. And so you get these reminders. And even the thing is, even when you're down, you still have to be listening and watching for those signals. Mm. First of all, I'm over here getting teary-eyed because this is just... (laughs) blowing my mind that anybody could look at Jessica and not immediately recognize her worth. But unfortunately, I understand exactly how you feel, Jessica. And I had this amazing epiphany. Sometimes you're going to wait a really long time to get to where you want to go. 
And then you get there and you're like, I can't move. How, how was it that I waited all this time? And now I can't even go anywhere. I mean, I made it. And now I can't go. But the thing is, I know that the way my God works, that the way this universe works, waiting in that line was worth it. This is going to be the ride of your life. It's going to be everything you waited for. You're in the front of the line. Your hands are going to be up. You're going to be screaming in the air. Like that, exactly. Um, Jessica, what has been your takeaway from our conversation? I think just live. Mm. Living a life intentionally. We don't have a lot of time, you know, we, we, we operate from a space of the guarantee that tomorrow is going to come and it's not, I lost a friend recently, you know, he had all these plans and one day there is no tomorrow. So for me, I live life urgently. I don't save good clothes for a special occasion. I drink champagne on a Tuesday. Okay, you know, because I'm living life urgently, you know, there are no special events. I'm going to wear my jewels to Trader Joe's because why (laughs) not? Yes. Because one day there will be no tomorrow. People are like, what do you want to do in five years? I have no idea. I'm not thinking about it. I don't know what I will be doing in November this year. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on living today. Because yeah. today, the now is all we have. And yeah. I truly believe that. And Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now is a book that changed my thinking. Ooh, ditto. The now is all we have. Because one day there is no tomorrow. What did you do today? So for me, I think that's the takeaway from all of this. It's like, be a good neighbor and live life urgently. Mm, I love that. My my takeaway is to be the stranger that someone says they received kindness from more often. Mm-hmm. That's what my takeaway mm-hmm. is. I want, and I feel like I am that, but I want to be more of that. Uh, me as too. many beautiful, yeah, as many beautiful experiences of I just got chills as I've had. I want to be that for more people. I want more people to go home mm. and be like this. This woman just mm. did such and such. This woman said, I don't know who she was. She had a mask on, that. but she. That is my takeaway. Ooh, I love. That. Ooh, I loved, oh yeah. my god, I'm like I'm taking that too. <laughs> yeah, but you taught me that, Jessica, from this conversation and the way you live your life. That's why it's my takeaway. So I just want you to know, Jessica, I love you. I honor you. And thank you so much for saying yes. And I am one of your biggest cheerleaders. Thank you, Ashley. I'm glad you got me. (laughs) After the credits, the famous traveler Jessica would take on a trip. Stay tuned. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Editing assistance from Jordan Cowling, mixed by Kojin Tashiro. Assistant producers are Michelle Baker and Shanice Tindall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to ensure you hear the next one. So which icon yes. from history are you jet setting with? Why? And where are you going? Anthony Bourdain. Oh, yeah. It's Anthony Bourdain. And me and Anthony Bourdain are going to Vietnam. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're going to Vietnam. I, he, I know that was a pet place that was really special to him. And he, he did a couple of episodes in Vietnam and there's just images of him there that I think about a lot. And I'm so sad that I never met Anthony Bourdain and I, I've met people who knew him and worked with him. And 
so many people have said to me, like, you can be the next Anthony Bourdain, which is like crazy. But you know what I love about that idea is it's not even like I have to be a white man to be the next Anthony Bourdain, right? It's like what Anthony Bourdain represented, people see that in me. And so I just wish that I could can, could share space with him. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, sis. I appreciate you.